Good. All right. Good morning. Yep, we're ready. We're here. We've prayed. We've checked in. We're going to encourage you to do the same as the folks here have at Cascadia Church, and that is to open your Bibles to the book of Esther. Uh, Today we're going to be looking, we're back at Route 66, 66 books in the Bible, and we're back on the road again. We had uh, Pastor Steve Crane help us the last couple of weeks in the book of Philippians. It was it was good. I really enjoyed our time with him. Uh, but we're going to look at uh, Esther today, one of the 66 books of the Bible. Esther is one of the two books in Scripture that never mentions the name of God. What is the other book? Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. <laughs> this just popped into my head. I must be tired. Um, e- even though... <laughs> Even though God's name is not found in the book of Song of Solomon, I'll bet both of them were going, there is a God. There is a God. When these people fell in love and they discovered how deep their love was and all that stuff, there is a God. Anyway, I digress significantly. Okay. So um, each of these books, we're going to look specifically at Esther today. It's very clear that God's fingerprints are all over this episode, this story. It's an amazing account one of my favorite stories in the scriptures that illustrates God's sovereignty. What I mean by that is his complete control of everything. And today we're going to see illustrated in the book of Esther that God never does anything arbitrarily. Nothing in God's way of doing things is either random or without purpose or without some sort of a a dimension to his grand plan for mankind, for his kingdom, and even for your life. That is going to be illustrated today in the book of Esther. And so we're going to discover that God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And there's a reason that he created us. There's a reason he put us here on earth now, at this time, and at this place. Uh, Joanne and I had a conversation with our daughter-in-law and her son, Joe. Uh, Tina was just uh, hired as the uh, department head for fibers at the Baylor University School of Arts. And this is like convergence for her. This is why God made Tina Linville. It was, was to be this department head. We talked about that. And it was a pretty amazing experience for us to finally see an answer to prayer for a very, very long time. We're incredibly proud of Tina and Joe and what they're doing. But it's just a, another illustration of how when we are living where God wants us to live, doing what God wants us to do, he prepares us for something bigger and better and greater. But listen, that's not just for Tina. That's for every human being. Every life matters. And what we do in this life should matter for eternity. And the way that we do things and the way that we interact with other people ought to be uh, done in such a way that conversations and relationships and participation and events or whatever it might be have an eternal impact. There's an eternal ring to what is happening. So wherever God has placed you in life, where you live, where you work, where you used to work, where you go to school, where you play, where you worship, whatever it might be, uh, there's a reason for that. There's a purpose for that. And God's sovereignty is going to be illustrated in the book of Esther that will shed light on why God has us as individuals and collectively as a group or as a neighborhood or as a work team or whatever it might be for his purpose and for his glory. So here is the theme of the book of Esther, providence, providence. You can also use the word sovereignty, where God illustrates and shows that he is in complete control of everything every little detail of our lives. A key verse, well known to many, I've seen it used many times in many ways in many different places. Esther's cousin said to her, who knows whether you have attained, whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. We're going to show you what that verse means in its context, what Mordecai meant when he said those words, what it meant to Esther, what it means to us today. I want you to think about the providence of God. 
I want you to think about his sovereignty, his complete control over all things, and how he works in miraculous, sometimes in mysterious ways, to accomplish his will. Here's, here's what I want to propose. God always uses, listen carefully, God uses problems to display his providence. He uses problems to display his sovereignty. He uses problems to display his glory. And I know, like you do, that the hardest part of, the hardest part of life is problems. <laughs> That's why they're problems. We don't like them. We don't want them to be a part of our life, but they have to be, as we're going to see in just a moment. Some of you know my friend, some of you know him as well, a pastor in Ukraine, Slavic Karpuk. I've been to his home several times. He's been to my home several times. I think the only English word that Slavic knows is problem. <laughs> it's the only word I think it's, and his wife's only, I think the only English word she knows is super. <laughs> They're just an amazing couple. We love them a lot. So I have a question. When was the providential sovereignty of God not displayed in the context of a problem? Think about, let me, let me say it again. I want you to think about this. When was the providential sovereignty of God ever displayed when there was not a problem? You understand what I'm asking? How did God reveal himself? How did God show himself other than in the context of a problem? I think the only time he ever did that outside the context of a problem was before sin came into the world creation. Since then, I think, and I need to think about this some more, but it's a new thought to me, and I've been processing it. I think since the fall, since Lucifer's rebellion, really, every time God demonstrated his sovereignty, his providence, his glory, was to solve a problem. To solve a problem. So today, a key word in the message is going to be problem. Slavic would love this sermon. So we're going to make this, we're going to make this interactive. We're going to make it kind of fun, I hope. And I hope you cooperate with me. When I go like this, I want you to say problem. Okay, let's test it. Problem. That's pretty good. Good, okay. Now, when I go like this, I want you to say problems. <laughs> let's try it again. Problem. Excellent. Good. Okay. All right. So you need to pay attention because I'm going to give you these. Whoa. <laughs> this is going to backfire. I should have thought through this some more as well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the only place God reveals, I think, his problem in, in sovereignty is where sin has created problems. problems. God is in the, in, the, in the business of displaying his sovereignty, of making his glory known. And he does that by sovereignly fixing problems created by sin. Yeah. Ten words. The book of Esther in ten words. Beautiful Jewish girl becomes queen, saves fellow Jews from slaughter. That's the heart. I'm so much trying to keep my hands under control. <laughs> um, yeah. The book of Esther, where were we? <laughs> it's going to be a long morning. Yeah, all right. In, in, the, in the day, back in the day when Esther was living, it was customary for the king to often throw a party. And don't say problem, I'm fixing my mic. And uh, he, would, he would throw a party to, to show off his wealth and sometimes his wife. And so uh, there, was one, there was one big long party and at the end of the party, uh, the king wanted his wife Vashti to come so people could gaze at her beauty. And she refused. Problem, yeah. So he didn't show up, she didn't show up, she embarrassed the king. Yeah, and he was advised to divorce his wife, hold a beauty contest, and the winner of the beauty contest gets to marry him. 
Well, yeah. That's a preemptive response. From, would you like to? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, how about if, uh, you know, how about if, if any elected official did that? You know, I'm now widowed. Let's have a beauty contest, and whoever wins gets to marry me. That's a problem. That's not going to work in our culture, but it did 2,500 years ago in Mesopotamia, where that was the cultural thing. That's what they did back in back in those days. And so there were beauty contests was held, and Esther won. So yay for Esther. She got to marry the king. And in so doing, God placed her exactly where he wanted her to be. And, and we're going to see how that all unfolded. Here's, here's your cartoon. Here's your, your picture for the day. Uh, you see here, what kind of a woman is this? It's a queen. And what kind of a carpet is she sitting on? Persian carpet. What kind of a cat? Persian cat. Yeah, so she's the queen of Persia, and she's holding the letter S. And what is she doing with that S? Stirring. Esther. Esther, the queen of Persia. Listen, you'll never forget it, will you? No, you'll get it, yeah. Yeah, all right. I think this whole message here you may never forget. All right, let's get into this. Number one, God puts me where he wants to use me. God puts me where he wants to use me. Here's a verse. We're going to come back and show you the context in a moment. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So God is setting the stage to do something amazing, incredible. And he is strategically placing Esther... Where he, wants, where he wants her to be so that he can do what he wants to do through her. And so the king needs a wife. Problem, all right? And God used that problem to solve an even bigger set of problems. Very good, thank you. I want you to think about this as we, before we move into it any farther. In the same way, God put Esther where he wanted her to be to make a difference in the lives of other people in the future, that God has done the same thing for you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're educated or not. None of that matters. What matters is whether or not you're faithful. It's the only thing that matters. If you are faithful where God has put you, he will use you. To solve the problems that come in life. And often it will be the problems of other people. And we'll see that God will bring people in our lives to solve our problems, to help solve our problems. How do we know what other problems that God wants us to solve? We don't. They'll show up. You can count on it. They'll come. Uh, What are you supposed to do to solve the problems? I don't know. But you'll know when those problems come. God will reveal to you what needs to be done. God is the best communicator in the universe. Nobody communicates better than he does. And he will make clear what he wants you to do, what he wants you to know. So how do we be prepared to be used by God in the future to solve problems? problems, whether they are ours or someone else's. Here we, as I mentioned, faithfulness. And here's what faithfulness looks like. If you've been hired to do a job, do what you're hired to do. That's faithfulness. If you go to school, do your assignments. If you have a ministry, ministry use your spiritual gift. Let me flip that. If you have a spiritual gift, have a ministry. That's better. Because you have a spiritual gift. If you have a family, love your family. Be faithful. That's the basic foundational stuff that God uses to do amazing things through our lives and for the sake of the lives of other people. 
Because when we are right now where God wants us to be, and we're doing right now what God wants us to do, that in the future we will have already been prepared to do what God wants us to do in that place. Does that make sense? All of it, all that's happening right now is preparation for something better in the future. And when we get there and we get that done, that's preparing us for something even better in the future. And life just goes on that way. All right. God puts me where he wants to use me. That's what happened with Esther. There's a reason she won this beauty contest. There's a reason God made her look the way that she did, because that's all the king was interested in. Is she hot? Okay, she wins. She's my wife. It's pretty shallow. It's pretty shallow. But that's what God used. That's how it happens. Here's number two. God wants others to help me. God wants others to help me. We're introduced to another character in this story. It's not fiction. It's nonfiction. It's reality. Another person is introduced, Mordecai, or Mordecai, however you'd like to pronounce it. Mordecai was Esther's cousin. Esther grew up without parents, and the scripture says that Mordecai was the child of her uncle. So that would make Mordecai her cousin. Mordecai raised Esther, and after Esther became queen, Mordecai overheard a conversation near the palace about this plot to kill the king. In Esther chapter 2, verse 22, the plot became known to Mordecai, and he informed Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in Mordecai's name. So Mordecai told Esther, Esther told the king that there was this problem. See this? Problem? Problem? Okay, yeah. All right. Yeah, this is a problem. Yeah, problem, yeah. And so uh, there, there was this, this plan to assassinate the king. Esther told, or Mordecai told Esther, Esther told uh, the king. Uh, the plot was confirmed. Problem. Yep, this is a reality. And those, the conspirators were executed. No, no problem. Okay, no problem. Problem solved. Look at this. They were both hanged on a wooden gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. So the king said, make a note of this. This man, Mordecai, saved my life. And the record was made. So now we are introduced to another person uh, in the story, but this guy's a big problem. His name is Haman. His name is Haman. He's arrogant, he's proud, he is powerful, second most powerful in the Persian Empire, and he wanted everyone to bow down to him. Uh, Mordecai refused because he was Jewish, and for Haman that was a big, big problem. All right. And Haman was so furious uh, that he convinced the king to destroy all Jews. Problem. Right. Now the king didn't know that his wife was Jewish. And so when he signed this decree, he signed his own wife's death warrant. Big problem. Big problem. And so Esther told Mordecai about what the king had done. He just signed a decree to annihilate all of our people, including me. We're all going to die. Big problem. Number three. God wants to use me where he put me. God wants to use me where he put me. Here's Mordecai's response to the news that he received from Esther. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Do you see his confidence in God's ability to keep his people? You see that? And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Esther, this is your point of convergence. This is why God made you. This is why God allowed you to be the queen. 
because he's going to use you to save his people. Now, notice Esther's amazing and brave response in verse 16. I will go to the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Here's what she means. It was illegal for even the wife of the king to come into his presence or to seek to be in his presence without his calling her or beckoning her to him. She could could not approach him on her own. It could cost her her life. But Esther knew that God was sovereign, uh, that God had placed her providentially uh, in Persia as the queen, the husband of the king. And he wanted God to use her where he put her. So the king saw Esther and asked her to come. And he said, Esther, honey, what's the, what's the problem? He could see it. And uh, he said, name it and I'll fix it. So now we fast forward. Um, Mordecai still refuses to bow to Haman. Haman is furious. He doesn't know what, what to do about this. Haman's wife says, why don't you build some gallows and hang him? Problem. There's this guy that's bugging you, just off him. Just knock him off. All right. So now the same night that Haman's wife said, hang this guy, the king has insomnia. And he can't fall asleep, so he says, why don't you give me something boring to read? Why don't you read something boring to me? Just read me a record of my kingdom. It's kind of like reading the bylaws, you know, of a church or everywhere else. You get insomnia, just read the bylaws. That'll put you to sleep. Yeah. So um, the records were read to him, and he was reminded that a man named Mordecai alerted him to an attempted well, what was going to be, there was a plot to, to kill the king. And the king says, what's been done to honor this man? And his readers said, nothing. Nothing has been done. And so the king says, we're going to honor this man. But I want to know how to best honor him. Here's probably my favorite part of the story. If you've got your Bibles, let's go to 6, chapter 6. Look at verse 6. So Haman came in. And the king said to him, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? (laughs) I just can't help but laughing, but to laugh. And Haman said to himself, whom would the king desire to honor more than me? Wow. Then Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king desires to honor, let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn and the horse on which the king has ridden and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to, the one, uh, to one of the king's most noble princes and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor and lead him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Then the king said to Haman, take quickly the robes and the horse, if you have said, and do so for it. Now underline this, Mordecai the Jew. Don't you love that? I think it's amazing. Who is sitting at the king's gate and do not fall short in anything so all that you have said. Anything of all that you have said. (laughs) So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. I just think that is awesome. I just think that's amazing. And so that's what they did. And for, for Haman, that was a big problem, right? And a part of the way that the king wanted to solve the, the questions or the problem for Esther was uh, he said, what would you like, what would you like for me to do, do for you? And she said a series of banquets with just you and Haman together. And in one of these uh, dinner events uh, is when Esther told the king reveals that somebody's trying to plot to kill me and all my people. And the king is enraged because this is a big 
problem. Right? So the king wants to know, who is it? <laughs> and he's looking at the guy right across the table. Esther says, a foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman came terrified before the king and the queen. Big problem. Busted. He's caught. The king enraged. And so he left the room to cool off. <laughs> and while that's happening, uh, Haman is all over Esther physically. Uh, not in a sexual way, but pleading and begging for his life. And the king walks back into the room and catches him. And then the king said, will, even, will he even assault the queen with me in the house? Notice this. As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now this is a huge... Because what happens is they covered him and put a, head, a, a hood over his head and took him out of the room and immediately executed him. That's what this is about. It's immediate execution. So this is a huge problem for Haman. But what is amazing is the way that he was executed. Remember Haman's wife said, why don't you build some gallows and hang this guy? The king said, hang Haman on his own gallows. Interesting twist of irony there. The story is filled with twists and turns in that way. And so, yeah, they hung Haman, and that was not a problem. Yeah. So the Jews were spared. It's the bottom line to the story. Uh, and Mordecai, <laughs> this is great, he was appointed to replace Haman. So now Mordecai the Jew is the second most powerful person in the entire kingdom of Persia. Mordecai's ring is now on him. Uh, Haman's ring is now on Mordecai's hand. He inherits all the, the, the staff, all the power, all the prestige, and everything that comes along with being in that position of authority. So uh, the Jews are spared. The people of God are secure. And it's just a great story. Uh, it's a great conclusion. Uh, there's a lot of twists and turns and irony, as I had said just a moment ago. So Esther and Mordecai, listen, both of them were put strategically in a place where God wanted them to be. And they trusted God. And how did they demonstrate their trust? Through action. They were not passive. You know, Mordecai went to Esther and said, we've got this problem, uh, and maybe God put you in that position to be a part of the solution. She could have said, you know what, I got it pretty good. I just don't want to take the risk of losing everything that God has given to me. It's just too risky, risky to, to go in front of the talk of the king. You know, God is God. Let's just sit back and see what he does. That is not what Esther did. That's not leadership. Esther said, I'm on it. And she took the initiative at her, at risking her own life to do so. And God honored it. Both of these people did something with their trust. They took action, God blessed it, lives were saved, and God was honored. Here's our takeaway. Who knows whether I have not attained, and you fill in the blank, for such a time as this. What did Esther attain? Royalty. All right? And it was that royalty that God used to solve problems in the lives of other people. So what is it that you have attained for such a time as this? And the, such a time as this means the problems you see. What have you attained so that the problems you see might be solved through where God has placed you or what God has given you? Right? Right? You may have attained a paycheck. You may have attained a house or food in your refrigerator for somebody who's hungry or a car for somebody who needs a ride or maybe a neighbor across the street. Maybe that's what you've attained, someone who is lonely, 
Someone who needs a friend. God put you where you work, where you live, where you play, where you worship for a reason. Because every person and everything, everywhere is broken. And God wants to bring healing, listen, not to you, but to somebody else through you. We need to, we need to understand that. Often, we view ourselves as consumers. What's in it for me? That's not biblical. Biblical is what's in it through me for others. You know, you get a group of people, and if they all come together on a Sunday morning saying, I need this, then you've got a group of people who have nothing to receive because nobody comes with anything to give. But if a group comes and says, I can offer this, every need will be met. Because every person comes realizing that I've attained something for such a time as this, whatever that time might be. That's the mindset, that's the mentality. That's the mentality. So, whatever it is you have, wherever it is you have been placed, uh, God did that. It's not an accident. It's not random. So, uh, how do we know what we're supposed to do? Just be faithful. You know, love your family. Do what you were hired to do. Do your school work, whatever it might be. Use your spiritual gift, whatever it might be. And then God will use that to prepare you to solve the problems in such a time as this. Okay. Um, if if we do that, I'm not going to have a problem with that. All right. None of us will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your sovereign control over all things. The way that you demonstrate uh, your provision, your providence, your generosity, your goodness, and often, and very well could be always, in the context of a problem or pain, or loss, or difficulty, disappointment, whatever it might be. And so Father, help us not to be people who seek to avoid problems, but to engage and to ask the question, have I not attained whatever it is for such a time as this? Maybe I can feed somebody. Maybe I can give somebody a ride Maybe somebody needs a place to live. Maybe somebody needs someone to talk to. Whatever it might be. There are unlimited possibilities. All it takes is for us just to be aware that you are sovereign. You do nothing randomly or for no reason. Help us, Father, to be people who understand that and choose to engage choose to trust you through action. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye. Don't say problem. Say goodbye, because I'm using a different hand now.